Go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we thank you so very much. We thank you for this day and we thank you for all your blessings. Help us to recognize them. <clears throat> Help us to have eyes to eat, to hear and <clears throat> ears to hear and eyes to see this morning. Help us understand your scripture. Help us get a revelation or some knowledge or some wisdom from it. And we ask you to be with us this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. Today we're talking about the seven I am statements of Jesus. Sorry, <coughs> somebody was supposed to be working the PowerPoint, but I guess they're not back there. But uh, my mom's going to try to get back there to work it for y'all. <coughs> So we're talking about the seven I am statements of Jesus. And the first scripture this morning is Exodus 3, 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now this is going to be a precedent for us as we go into the New Testament. But I am is one of the names of God. One of the descriptions of God. He says, I am who I am. Okay? He is. He was. And he for, forever shall be. So he's the Alpha and the Omega. He is. Alright? So that's like a definitive statement he's saying. I am. He doesn't even have to have anything attached to it. He's just saying, I am. Now that's pretty powerful to me. So as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see in different places where Jesus says, I am. Well, let's go to Matthew 16, 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some, Elijah. Some others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, the Christ is also the Messiah. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, which Peter in the Greek means rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now let me first talk about this real quick. People had a wide view of who they thought Jesus was. Alright? And none of them had it right. A lot of them thought he was a prophet of some kind. But they just didn't know which one he might be. And it was only by God's revelation to Peter did he even acknowledge that he was the Messiah that was prophesied to come? And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you that God revealed this to you from heaven. And then he says, On this rock I will build my church. Now some people have misinterpreted this meaning since Peter means rock, that on Peter God would build his church. But that's not necessarily the truth. Yes, Peter was greatly used for advancing the kingdom of God. I'm not saying that. But the truth behind what Peter said is what God would build his church. <clears throat> the truth behind who Jesus was, the I am of Jesus, was that he was our Messiah, our Christ, our Savior. He was the one who was prophesied to come to deliver us. And on that point, on that truth, God has built His church. And He has. And He continues to build it. That Jesus is the Christ. He is our Savior. Is He your Savior this morning? 
I know that he is mine and I am so thankful. And then he goes on to say, the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Do you think that the devil could do anything to stop Jesus? I don't think so. He thought he did by trying to get him crucified. He thought he was getting him out of the way. But what he was doing was accomplishing God's mission. Thank you, Lord. So I'm thankful this morning that nothing can prevail against God. You might be dealing with something in your life and you might be saying, this is so hard. Why is God allowing this to happen to me? I thought that the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against God's people. Well, sadly, we still have to struggle in this world. But nevertheless, no matter what bad happens to you, God will work it out for your good some kind of way. God will work it out for the good of His kingdom some kind of way. So even though you may die, you may become a martyr, that death will go on and live forever. The people who see you die will stir up within them a heart to live for the Lord. They will see the truth of Christianity. So even though you die, it doesn't even matter because God is using that, whatever it is, to bring about something good. But you have to look beyond your situation to see that. You have to look beyond the woe is me to see that. Amen. Because we all have woe is me. Amen. We all have woe is me, let me tell you. Every one of us has something we're dealing with. An ache or a pain or a debt or a loss or, or a financial instability or something in our life that we're dealing with at any given time. And sometimes it gets overwhelming, folks. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, even me, knowing all the truth that I know, it still gets <laughs> overwhelming. But there still is one truth that remains. That He is good. Amen. And He is the center of my life. And He will get me through it. And He will turn it around for my good and His good and the good of the kingdom. That's what gets me through it. And that's what I hope gets you through any storm you may have to deal with in your life. But let's go ahead and get to the seven I am statements of Jesus. The first one, I am the true vine. John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Let me stop right there real quick. He says, every branch in me. Alright? Every branch that is in God, that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Meaning, he causes to die. So, if you are truly saved in God, but you don't bear fruit, God might actually have to allow you to die. Alright? Now, does that mean you're not saved? No. That just means He's taking you out of the way. You're not bearing fruit. You're not doing anything good for the kingdom. You're not doing anything good for the vine. So He has to take you away so that the other vines may produce. All right? Let me just clear that up for you because some people get that misunderstood. All right? And then He says, In every branch that, bear, prayers, that bears fruit, He prunes. So even though you're bearing fruit, he may still be pruning you. All right? Now that pruning <clears throat> process doesn't feel good. All right? That's him chastising you. Oh, you messed up here. Let me spank you a little bit. He's doing this so that you will bear more fruit in him. All right? Don't you want to bear a lot of fruit for God? Maybe. I know I do. I want to bear so much fruit that everywhere I go, people are getting something from me. I had, I had two trees over here in my yard. I had a huge loquat tree. Huge one. Last year produced tons of loquats. Does everybody know what a loquat is? It's a little orange, a little fruit. Very tasty. <laughs> I was hooked the first time I had one. Alright? It produced tons. This year, zero. All right, now that's crazy. My other tree, which is about this tall, all right, 
Didn't produce anything last year. Produced about five to seven this year. So I'll still get to taste some loquats, but it wasn't as many as I got to eat last year. But that was the difference. One bared a lot of fruit one year. One didn't bear any. <laughs> then it reversed. The small tree, which I wasn't expecting anything from, bared fruit that I was able to enjoy. And even though it was a small amount, it was an amount that I could enjoy. Now I relate this to someone who is far along in their Christian walk, the big tree, and someone who is just starting out, the little tree. Alright? So even though you may be a little tree, very new to the Lord, very unlearned in the Scriptures, God can still use you to bear fruit for Him in His kingdom. Tasty fruit. Fruit that is good, well nourished. Alright? And even though you're advanced in the Lord, you may have been serving God all your life, you know the scriptures very well, you can still potentially not bear fruit. Okay? Something may happen to you. Some struggle you're dealing with. You stop bearing fruit. Alright? God is showing us something from the natural to relate to the spiritual. So what do you want to be? No matter where you are in God, whether you're just starting out or you're out far along with the Lord in your relationship, where do you want to be? Do you want to bear fruit for Him? Yes. I know I do. I know that I have got to. So I, I, I give this to you and I pray that you get something out of that, that you will bear fruit in your life. It's not good enough just to know the truth of God. You have to bear the fruit. You have to show yourself approved. Alright? Let me continue here. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And that's the key right there. That is the key for you bearing fruit in your life for God. Is you making sure you've got God right with you. That you make sure that you have that connection with him. A constant connection. Not a separation well, I'm going to leave the vine for a little while and go live my sinful life how I like to. Then on Sundays, I'm going to come back to the vine and have a good old time. All right? It doesn't work that way. All right, folks? You're going to feel the stress and the burn of this world even harder when you do that. It's not going to be good for you. No, you have to say, I'm going to hang on to that vine even whenever those winds come trying to blow me off. I'm going to hang on to the vine because I'm not going to be loosed. Because I want to be a part of God. I want to be attached to Him. I don't want to let go because I know in Him is how I bear much fruit. So let that be so for all of us today. That there will be nothing that draws you away from God. That you want to stay connected to Him at all costs. The second I am of Jesus. I am the bread of life. John 6, 35-48. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Let me stop right there. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. That's what the Bible says. That's what he's talking about. Not natural hunger and not natural thirst, but spiritual hunger. Spiritual thirst. Do you hunger after God? Do you desire God? Is He your number one desire? Because if He's not, it will be known to you. We all put something in the number one spot. Whether it's addiction, any alcohol, uh, cigarettes, drugs, sex outside of marriage. You take your pick. Whatever it is, if you put it in the number one spot, God's got to be somewhere else. And your life is not going to be what it was meant to be when you do that. 
You have to put God in the right spot, the number one spot. Then everything else, I don't need it. Any other sin, get it out of here. I got God in the right spot. Now, we'll still mess up, <coughs> but thankfully, if you have God in the right spot, you won't do it as much. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That all, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. But should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about Him because He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that He says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. You know, Jesus says, Every man shall not live off of bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then we see also in John where the word is Jesus. The word was made flesh. So we see that for us to live and have true nourishment for our souls and our spirits and for to have true well-being, we have to live off of God's Word. Are you nourished this morning? I'm going to make sure that you're going to leave here nourished. Because every time I preach, i got to have a, amount, a good amount of scriptures that I know that when you leave here, you will be full. But it is up to you to feed yourself as well. I can't hand feed you every day. This is me hand feeding you, okay? You have to go read the Bible the Word of God for yourself. Go nourish yourselves seven days a week. Alright? Go home and read the Bible. You've got to. Because if you don't, your spirit is going to be malnourished. You're going to feel weak in the spirit if you do not. And guess what? This affects everything else that goes on in your body as well. Your mind will not be right. Your body won't be right. Your words won't be right. Your actions won't be right. But when you read the Word of God on a continual basis, you will start to align yourself with it. Your will shall be His will. Your way shall be His way. Your words shall be His words. You have to do it. You need it. Because He is the bread of life. Now, the bread back in the day was not just like our bread today. You go buy a, a bread of white bread, a loaf of white bread, you're not going to get much nourishment from it. The bread they made back in the day had all kinds of stuff in it, oils and, and vitamins and everything. There was, I mean, the wheat and everything was good back then. They knew that they had to put all the stuff in there to gain nourishment for their bodies. You could eat bread and be fine. All right? But nowadays, you can't just live off of bread. All right? So, even still, even if we had the purest bread we can think of, all the best foods, even if you worked out all the time and did everything right, you still won't be right unless you have the Word of God in you. Because that is how we live. True life. Not just existing, because all of us exist, but true life is only in Him. Alright, I'm about to get to that. Number three. <clears throat> I am the way, the truth, and life. 
John 14, 16. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So do you want to know which way to live? It's through Jesus. Because he says, I am the way. Do you want to know what the truth is? It's through Jesus. Everything that God has said in His Word. Read His Word. You will know what the truth is. Do you want to know, is it, is it okay for people to be homosexuals or not? You'll find out the truth if you re read the Word of God. Do you want to know if it's okay to get drunk? You'll find out if you read the Word of God. Do you want to know if it's okay to have sex outside of marriage? You'll find out if you read the Word of God. Do you want to know the way to get to heaven? You'll find out if you read the Word of God. Because he says that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, there's a lot of people out there who will say, God's going to let everybody come to heaven one day. Yeah. It's called universalism. And they believe they're Christians. Yeah. But they don't read the Word of God plainly, obviously. <laughs> because it says that... The, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. Now that might be a sad truth. And it is a sad truth. Because there's many people who are dying and going to hell. It says narrow is the path. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's a lot of people going to, towards destruction. Because narrow is the path. And you know why it's so narrow? Because it's Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. That's why he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one. No one will see heaven. No one will get to go there unless you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. And then you're good. Settle it in yourself. If you have Jesus as your Lord, you've got it. You've got it. All y'all who are sitting in here, thankfully, y'all believe, don't you? You've made Jesus your Lord, haven't you? Well, I'm going to see you in heaven one day because I'm going to be there too. It's going to be awesome. As a matter of fact, if we get raptured, I might just high-five you on the way up. <laughs> but like I said, He is the life. And when you have Jesus Christ, you will have true life. Don't you want true life? I'm going to tell you, it's the best. Let's go to the fourth one. I am the light. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If you are truly following Jesus Christ, and He is really your Lord and Savior, you're going to be walking around like a light. In, in the spiritual realm, you've got light shining from you. You're better than a flashlight, let me tell you. And guess what? That dark darkness is fleeing from you. Now, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. What's the fastest thing in the world? Light. Everybody says that. It is light. Most people agree, when you ask them that question, what is the fastest thing? Light. But I beg to differ. The fastest thing is darkness getting out of the way of light. All right? It's got to be faster, right? Because once light hits, darkness is gone. So when you shine light anywhere on yourself and you say, oh, that's sin, let me shine the light on that, that darkness has to get out of there. That darkness will flee. That sin in your life will leave. So when you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the light of the world, He will shine in that dark place on you and that darkness will get out of there. But you've got to be willing to shine that light on yourself. You've got to be willing to expose that sin. Because when you do, it will leave. You don't have to be in bondage to any sin. You may have been dealing with something all your life. But you have to do something for yourself. You've got to say, that is sin. You've got to declare it. You've got to say it out loud. That is sin. And I don't like it. I don't want it. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I want to live righteously. I want to walk in the light. I don't want to walk in the darkness because that's where the devil and the demons like to hide. Alright? They like to hide because they're little scared things. But when you walk in the light, you ain't got to be scared. You ain't got to be scared. I used to be scared of the dark. Who's ever been scared of the dark? Guess what? Whenever I got God everywhere I go, I'm not scared. 
Because that light is shining from me. And I know it's shining. Matter of fact, I know when demons see me coming, they're running. Not because of who I am, but because of who a God is in me. And I believe it. That's why I'm not scared. Amen. When you don't believe it, that's when you get scared. Matter of fact, not only am I not scared of devils and demons, but I'm not scared of anything. I'm not scared of anybody. Matter of fact, if somebody comes in this room right now with a gun, I'm walking right up to them because I ain't scared. Because I would rather them shoot me than shoot any one of y'all. And matter of fact, if that ever happens, you will see me run into the door. Because I ain't scared. Because I know where I'm going. You know where I'm going? The best place anybody could ever hope to be. Heaven. Where God is. Where there's no pain. Where there's no negative. Where everything is good. Where everything is joy. Where everything is peace. Where everything is comfort. Don't you want to go there? So why do you need to be scared about anything? I'm not scared. Matter of fact, all the stuff that's going on at Beaumont, I'm not scared about it. You know why? Because if I saw somebody holding a gun, I would walk over to him and I'd say, Hey, Jesus Christ can save your life. Now, he very well may shoot me. That's fine. I did my job. And if it's my time to go, I'll go. But if it's not, God will cause that gun to jam or do some fire off the other way or do something. That's why I walk around with, a, with, with comfort. Because I know no matter what happens, it's inside of God's will. Whether I live or die. And it gives you such a peace. But you've got to have trust in Him for that. You've got to have true belief in Him. Let's go to the fifth one. We're getting close to the end, y'all. I am the resurrection and the life. See, He says it again. I am the life. John 11, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Though you may die in this world, you're going to live for eternity. This life is just a breath. And it's over with. Some of you older folks know what I'm talking about. You can remember when you were in high school, can't you? It just seems like the time has flown by, hasn't it? Amen. And that's what this world does. It'll fly on by. Because it's over with quick. He calls it a vapor. He calls it a breath. He calls it a mist. It's just quick. When you breathe, up, oh, it's gone. That's what our life is. But eternity never ends. So that's what you need to live for. If you know this life is but a breath and it's over quickly, then don't live for the pleasures and, and your wants and desires of this life but live for eternity, God, and what He has provided. His way, His truth, His word, His will. That's what you want. Because then you are setting up your eternity. You're storing up treasures for your eternity. Not the treasures of this world. Okay, because we're all leaving that to somebody else. We all write out wills, don't we? All right, this person gets this, this person gets that. Whoop, you can have this, you can have that. But when you store up your treasure in heaven, nobody gets it. You get it. For all eternity. So don't you want to live for that? Amen. Don't you want to live for Him with your life? I know I do. And matter of fact, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now to resurrect something means to bring something from the dead back to life. When you live in your sin and your sinful state, you are dead. All right? But when you come to God, you make Him your Lord, He will resurrect you to who you were meant to be. Now, God has already mapped out for all of us a plan for our lives. He already has who He has called you to be. But some of us like to go our own way. We like to fight against that plan. We like to make our own plan. But let me just tell you, when man plans, God laughs. All right, now that's an actual quote. I can't remember who it's from. But that's the truth. I don't, I don't remember how many times I've made a plan and it didn't come to pass. All right, but when God makes a plan, it comes to pass. So don't you want to live according to God's plan? I know I do. The sixth one. I am the door. John 10, 7. 
Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He is the door. Now what does that mean? It's basically an eloquent way of saying He is the way to salvation. He is the door to heaven. He's the door you go through. You don't try to go around the back. Let me try to find some other way to get saved. I'm a good person. Maybe God will let me in. No, not going to happen. Because we know that none of us are good, as the Word declares. In ourselves, in and of ourselves, on our own merits, none of us are good. But when you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get to go right to the front of the line. VIP fast. Come on, right this way, sir. Oh, Jesus Christ is your Lord. Come on in. Come on into heaven. You ain't got to go around the back. You ain't going to get in. It's locked up tight. Trust me, you can't sneak into heaven. All right? There's angels that are huge. Swords all around. You ain't getting into heaven. All right? Go through the, go through the door that you know is open. That is Jesus Christ. Number seven, I am the good shepherd. On that note, he says, the sheep will go through the door. Now we see that he says, I am the good shepherd. So let's go to John 10, 11 through 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We know he died for us on the cross. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Alright? Who knows God this morning? I hope you do. Because it is such a blessed thing to know God. Not only do you know Him, but He knows you. And it's an intimate knowledge. Not just know about, but it is a relationship knowledge. I have a connection with God. Do you have a connection with God today? I pray that you do. Because you will truly have life. Two more scriptures. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God is your shield. He is your protector. He will keep you safe until the appointed time when He allows something to happen to you that will advance you or advance His kingdom in some kind of way. But He is your protector. And then it says He is your great reward. When we look at God as our treasure of our life, He will be your great reward. What else do you need? To have God in your life is all you need, right? I don't need millions of dollars. I don't need a mansion. I don't need a Ferrari. I don't need a Corvette. I don't need a Lamborghini. I don't need all that stuff because I got God. I don't have to have the finest clothes. I don't have to have the finest things because I have God. You learn to become content when you realize that God is the true treasure of this world for you to have. When you truly accept that, nothing else matters. That's when He can become the center of your life. Psalm 46.10, and this is the final one. We'll close out with this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that God is the I am of everything that you need. Everything I said, all the I am statements of Jesus, He is the I am of your life. And you have it all in Him. Be comforted and rest in that. Be still and know that, that God is everything you need. Do you feel good this morning? Y'all feel all right? Yes. Is God the great I am to you? Is He all that you need? this morning I'm telling you it feels so good when you make him all that you need whenever you, whenever you get down to your bottom dollar you don't even care because you got God in your life your bottom dollar don't even matter or whether you got a million dollars it don't even matter because you got God and he is true riches he is your true reward he is your true treasure and that will get you through all your days 
no matter what happens to you, all the bad, all the negative that this world has to offer you, if you know I got God, I got the great I am in my life, that'll get you through everything. You know, I love that parable when Jesus was in the boat and the storm was raging around and everybody was scared, but Jesus was sleeping. He's like me. I like to sleep through storms. That's the best sleep I get. I'm telling you. He was like me. He was sleeping right through it. They wake him up. Oh, Lord, wake up. We're scared. The storm's raging around us. We're going to die. He was like, oh, you have little faith. Peace. Be quiet. The storm went away. No problems. That's what God can do for you in your life, too. Amen. You're all so scared and worried about this big storm raging around you, but you got the God of everything who created everything, and you're crying out, Oh, I'm so scared. I'm worried about this. Cry to God. God, help me. I'm dealing with this. This is hard. This is a struggle. This is a pain. This is hard. I need you. Peace be still. You know, I've been through a lot of different crazy stuff in my life, and not any of it is still happening right now. Amen. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've all been through some hard stuff. But it, it's over after a while. Just like a storm is. No matter how loud, no matter how many lightning strikes, no matter how hard that wind is blowing, it always is clear after a while, isn't it? Yeah. That's how you need to look at every storm in your life. I got the great I am on my side. Even if I'm in the storm, hey, it's all right. Yeah. God's with me. Let that be your comfort today. If you're going through something, let that comfort you this morning. Let's go ahead and close in prayer on that. Father, we love you and thank you so much. You are so good and you are enough. You are the center of our lives. You are the center. And you are more than enough. And we're so thankful we got you this morning. The great I am, the God of all things, is on my side. I get to be on His side. And He's with me. He's in me. He's walking with me. And He's taking care of me. And we love you and thank you this morning. And we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.